Shalom, Esther Gidu Yuat. It's Tuesday, May 10th. This is Africa 54. Why is the war in Ukraine having an impact on food prices in Africa? We'll explain. Hopes of increased revenues are in jeopardy as African airlines halt international and domestic flights due to the high fuel costs. And rights groups in Zimbabwe hope a new law will bring an end to child marriage. United Nations agencies warn that price hikes sparked by Russia's invasion of Ukraine is likely to worsen a food crisis in Africa. Tens of millions of people across the continent are already battling extreme poverty caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, armed conflicts, climate shocks and economic turmoil. Clara Frank has more. In Zimbabwe, fuel prices are rising and the currency rapidly devaluing. This has had an impact on fertilizer prices, which leading fertilizer firm Omnia Holdings says has hit small-scale farmers the hardest. Boniface Mortize, who grows maize and soybeans just outside Harare, said he had started making his own fertilizer by mixing cow dung or chicken waste with zinc. But he said he needs ammonium nitrate, which is not produced in large quantities in Zimbabwe. The war has disrupted shipping in the Black Sea, a major artery for grains and other commodities, suppressing exports from Russia and Ukraine to markets including Africa. The um, global um, inflation is being imported into African economies because Africa is so dependent on imports for food, fuel, medicines and consumer durables. We are going to see um, tensions. Um, whether or not this would spill over into uh, violent protests um, is unclear. But um, what history, uh, particularly recent history, has taught us is that this is a distinct possibility. Abebe Hele Gabriel, Assistant Director General of the UN Food and Agriculture Organization and its representative for Africa, said nearly half of the continent's 54 countries rely on Russia and Ukraine for wheat imports. Russia is also a major supplier of fertilizer to at least 11 countries. This uh, war, uh, the Ukraine war, has uh, is, is overlapping. The impact is overlapping with uh, a crisis that uh, has already been unfolding in several countries. Uh, we have a very grim uh, outlook uh, going forward. Even before the conflict in Ukraine, food inflation was pushing many African families to the brink. In Zimbabwe, households are already feeling the pain. Harari resident Tarisai Gueje says it is a struggle to afford three meals. Uh, used to have three meals a day. We used to buy even meat. You could get meat and eat meat almost um, five days a, a, a week. But these days you can even go for seven days without getting any meat, without getting three meals a day. So it's really tough for people. The UN World Food Program estimates that some 5.3 million Zimbabweans, around a third of the population, are food insecure. Clara Frank, VOA News. Air transport across Africa is critical in facilitating business, international trade and tourism. In 2022, most regional airlines were expecting their revenue to increase, but those hopes appear to be shrinking as airlines are halting international and domestic flights due to the high cost of fuel. Paul Ndiho has more. The International Air Transport Association says the aviation industry is struggling due to the high cost of fuel, and African airlines are no exception. South African Airways has not been profitable. The airline has lost billions of dollars in the last seven years, and the troubled air carrier announced Tuesday it was cancelling 14 flights affecting over 3,000 passengers. 
The airport's a company of South Africa says it's working to rectify the fuel shortage at the Oliver Tambo International Airport in Johannesburg. The airport receives its fuel supply via rail and the rail system has sustained major damage due to the recent flooding in Durban and it has just over three days of fuel left. In Nigeria, several airlines are halting domestic flights until further notice due to rising fuel costs. A scarcity of fuel since March has caused some African airlines to cancel daily operations. The global jet fuel prices have soared after Russia's invasion of Ukraine triggered a surge in the crude oil market, hitting airlines and passengers with steeper increases. Airline passengers in Nigeria pay for fares in the Naira, which has weakened the sharply due to devaluations. Suppliers are paying for fuel in US dollars, a scarcer currency in Nigeria. Nigeria's aviation ministry says it's concerned about the difficulties and the sparring airfares due to jet fuel costs. Still, it appealed to the airlines to consider the effects of a shutdown on travelers at home and abroad. Meanwhile, Kenya Airways expected to see a 20% raise in revenues this year, but that remains to be seen. Uganda Airlines, which was revived nearly two years ago, is also struggling. The airline is not profitable and it is heavily subsidized. Air Tanzania bounced back purchasing a Boeing 7878 Dreamliner package valued at $224 million. However, it's costly to maintain and could cost Tanzanian taxpayers millions of dollars. Last but not least, Rwanda Air, the state-owned flagship carrier of Rwanda, operates domestic and international flights and may be too optimistic with its financial expectations and is running on losses. Paul Ndiho, VOA News. In the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, 14 civilians were killed in an attack on a displaced persons camp in Ituri province, according to a monitoring group. The Kivu security tracker says the attack occurred on Monday. It added that it suspects militants from an ethnic armed group called Kodeko to be behind the attack. Kodeko, the name for the cooperative for the development of the Congo, is a political religious sect that claims to represent the interests of the Lendu ethnic group. It is considered one of the deadliest militias operating in the east of the country and it's blamed for a number of ethnic massacres in Ituri. Burkina Faso's armed forces said on Tuesday they had killed at least 50 terrorists in two operations. A rapid reaction force responding to an ambush Monday near Baraku in the northwestern region pursued the assailants, killing at least 40 of them. A commando unit launched an attack Monday near Dijogu in the southwest of the country, near the border with Ivory Coast. The operation carried out in coordination with volunteer forces led to the death of 10 terrorists. Burkina Faso has been struggling since 2015 with a jihadist insurgency that is mainly concentrated in the country's north and west. The African Mining in Daba conference is underway in Cape Town amid a global scramble for new sources of metals prompted by the conflict in Ukraine. David Doyle has more. The African Mining in Daba conference opened in Cape Town on Monday just as global focus shifts to the continent in a search for new sources of metals. Amid the conflict in Ukraine, sanctions on top producer Russia have increased the Africa risk appetite for major miners who find themselves with few alternatives. Companies and investors are considering projects they may have previously overlooked. Governments are also looking to Africa, anxious to ensure their countries can procure enough metals. Organizers say this year's conference, running from May the 9th to the 12th, will be attended by the highest ranking U.S. government official in years, as well as representatives from the Japan Oil, Gas and Metals Corporation, a sign perhaps of wealthy countries' concerns about securing supply. But the risks associated with mining in sub-Saharan Africa remain. The acute security challenge facing mines in the gold-rich Sahel was highlighted last month. 
Russia's Nordgold abandoning its Tapaco mine in Burkina Faso over an increasing threat from militants. Even the continent's most industrialized economy, South Africa, has its challenges. Deteriorating rail infrastructure there is forcing some coal producers to resort to trucking their product to ports. Russia is responsible for 7% of global nickel supply, 10% of platinum and 25 to 30% of palladium. With that off the table, Africa's rich deposits start looking a lot more attractive. That was David Doyle of Reuters reporting. A Ugandan court is ordering the government to reconsider its decision to suspend the country's most prominent rights organization, handing the group a lifeline after its operations were forced to stop last August. Chapter 4, one of uh, 54 non-governmental organizations ordered to suspend activities following presidential elections last year during which opposition leaders were arrested activists disappeared and several dozen people gunned down. In a ruling emailed to Chapter 4 late Monday, High Court Judge Musa Sekana called the decision to indefinitely suspend the organization as irregular. We'd like to hear what you think about Africa 54. Africa 54's new Facebook page is facebook.com slash VOA Africa. Wednesday on Africa 54, Paul Ndiho has the latest in technology. Still to come today, we'll explain the transforming of Nigeria's youth through dance. But first, Heidi Adams tells us what's coming up on Wednesday's Straight Talk Africa. On the next Straight Talk Africa, nearly 20 years after the alleged genocide committed in Sudan's Darfur region, the first suspect is on trial at The Hague. What does his trial mean for those who have long called for justice? One activist told me, you know, the, the most important thing is giving dignity back to the victims, giving them a voice, giving them a chance to face their accuser. What they are also saying is that Bashir, uh, Ahmed Harwood, Abdul Rahim, Muhammad Hussein, and others who are indicted must be brought to justice for, for, for this to be a complete process. Also, the war in Ukraine is spiking the prices of food and fuel. We'll look at two African countries reeling from the soaring cost of living. Join me, Heidi Adams, on the next Straight Talk Africa. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living. Right here on VOA. Zimbabwe's authorities say more than one-third of girls in the country are married before the age of 18, and in some areas, more than half are minors. Rights advocates are loading a new law that criminalizes child marriage for the first time. Columbus Mavunga reports from Bire. 19-year-old Posha Nobula is from the Mbire area near Zimbabwe's border with Zambia and Mozambique. She says she was raped at 15 on her way from school, became pregnant, and then was forced to marry her attacker. Our marriage was never my will. I was forced by my parents. I was very brilliant at school, and I was messed up by men. Her case is not unusual, say children's advocates. The major cause of child marriages here is that children walk long distances to school, some 12 or 13 kilometers each way. So a child ends up leaving school, and since there is nothing like training in woodwork or sewing, she ends up being married. Advocates and non-profit groups are working with the government to reduce child marriage in Mbire, in Mashonan Central Province, where more than half the girls get married before they turn 18. We are doing awareness campaigns at gatherings like these as one way to reduce the problem of child marriages. We do these campaigns with parents and girls, as well as teach them about their sexual and reproductive rights. Traditional leaders are accused of promoting the practice or turning a blind eye to it. 
Chief Chutsungo, a traditional leader here, says he's punishing parents who marry off their children by finding them. You take a child to the hospital when the child falls sick. It's the child's right. So we meet regularly with parents and, also, there are non-governmental groups doing awareness campaigns. Legal experts say a new law criminalizing child marriage should help combat the problem. There were gaps and loopholes that existed in terms of when exactly a, a person could contract into a marriage legally. So by extension, however, there is need for the Criminal Law and Codification Reform Act to introduce a clear law that stipulates uh, child marriages as an offense and also introduces sentencing guidelines for perpetrators of child marriages. Poshia Nobula is hoping other girls will not have to endure what she has. Those convicted under the new child marriage law face up to 10 years in prison, though advocates for children's rights are pushing for a harsher sentence. Columbus Mavunga for VOA News, Mbire, Zimbabwe. It's time for Health Report and joining us now is Africa 54 Health Correspondent Lino Mudu with news on COVID-19 vaccines in Africa. Hello, Lino. Hello, Esther. The U.S. Senate has confirmed Dr. John Nkengasong, Ambassador at Large, Coordinator of the United States Government Activities to Combat HIV AIDS Globally. He is expected to lead, manage and oversee the U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR. U.S. President Joe Biden nominated Nkenga Song for the role in September last year. The virologist from Cameroon currently serves as the director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, an agency leading the fight against COVID-19 on the continent. Before heading the Africa CDC, Nkenga Song worked at PEPFAR on strengthening laboratory capacity across Africa. PEPFAR works in over 50 countries and was launched in 2000. 2003 by former U.S. President George W. Bush. The organization estimates to have saved over 20 million lives since its creation. South Africa's pharmaceutical Aspen says its COVID-19 vaccine plant risks shutting down after receiving not a single order. Africa's efforts to develop its own COVID-19 vaccine is struggling due to the lack of demand. South Africa's Aspen Pharmacare negotiated a licensing deal in November to package and sell Johnson & Johnson's COVID-19 vaccine and distribute it across Africa. This was held as a game-changing moment for Africa, the region with a low vaccination rate, partly due to low supply. But Aspen's COVID-19 vaccine production now faces closure after getting no orders, according to the company. Aspen's CEO, Stephen Saad, last week warned it would be forced to repurpose about half of its vaccine production capacity if orders did not pick up. The Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has called on organizations procuring doses for the continent to prioritize sourcing from African producers. Observers say one problem may be that the global vaccine sharing program, COVAX, which has been instrumental in Africa's pandemic response, does not currently need any more shots. COVAX is backed by the WHO, the Global Vaccine Alliance Gavi, and the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. The World Health Organization and its COVID-19 vaccine partner, Gavi, say they have no immediate plans to buy shots made by Aspen Pharmacare. Aspen's CEO, Saad, has warned the current lack of demand calls into question the viability of local production of vaccine, endangering Africa's future vaccine security. And that's our health report for today. Esther, back to you. Thank you, Lino. Be sure to watch Lino Mudu's health reports every Tuesday on Africa 54. When you think about places to get some rest, airplanes don't normally come to mind. Aerotel, however, is trying to change that. Romain Chanson reports from northern South Africa and VOA's Carol Gunsberg narrates. This Boeing 737 once flew in Australia, the United States and Afghanistan. 
But in 2019, the aircraft landed permanently in South Africa's northernmost province of Limpopo in the town of Houtsprout. Retired from air service, it has been transformed into a boutique hotel. The 40-year-old aircraft's cabin has been retrofitted with six bedrooms. So this is how the rooms look. All of them look briefly the same. They just mirror one another. We use the head compartment as well for extra storage, maybe a blanket for if someone gets cold. And then this side is the hangers, extra storage space, mirror, mini fridge, safe. Well, we have limited space, so we try to keep it as unique and original as possible. So then that's why the shower is also a little bit smaller, but has everything you need. Instead of where you're in a normal plane, sit uncomfortable with someone behind you, next to you, here you can relax, sleep nicely, no one to bother you. Oh, it's so cute. Very nice. This Johannesburg family has come not only to order drinks, but also to explore the plane turned hotel. Visitors can walk on the wing for an elevated look at the African bush and Drakensburg Mountains. But the cockpit is the main attraction. Okay, <laughs> take off. Why do you want to fly? Uh, we're flying to Bali. I fly a lot, so I face my fears quite often. <laughs> but this is like, I can actually enjoy the aeroplane. Yeah, being uh, able to actually sit in an airplane seat and having a cocktail and watching the African sunset is really something that I've never experienced before. So in Stockholm, Sweden, another company has converted a jumbo jet into a budget hotel. The more luxurious South African hotel, where a night's stay cost $220 per couple, was imagined by real estate developers Martin and Tracy Dundunen. We really just wanted to rebuild or repurpose or recycle an aeroplane that was going to be scrapped. So when this one came along, it was sort of perfect. And yeah, the wow factor remains, the, the uniqueness and when people visit it and they, they're quite astounded at what's been achieved. And in the meantime, we've acquired the second aeroplane. Last June, Aerotel acquired a second jetliner, a Boeing 727 that previously belonged to the president of Djibouti. It will be transformed into a private three bedroom hotel that can be leased in its entirety. Visitors can realize an even crazier dream sleeping in a presidential plane. For Romain Chanson in Houtsprout, South Africa, Carol Gunsberg, VOA News. Here's a sneak peek into a special VOA documentary about residents in Abidjan, Ivory Coast. Quatrième pont qui part qui passe ici, c'est à cause de quatrième pont ils ont détruit tout ça ici. Un quatre heures du matin, la police nationale se retrouve avec la gendarmerie et on leur dit de sortir, ils vont dégager chez elle. La maison elle est belle, mais il y a plein de travaux qui ne sont pas encore terminés, comme la douche, le sol. Ça peut poser d'énormes problèmes en termes de, de sécurité, en termes de, de cohésion sociale, d'avenir politique du pays. Be sure to watch the full documentary at viewernews.com slash documentaries. A troupe called The Incredible Kids is giving underprivileged youths in Nigeria a way to transform their lives through dance. Louisa Nax has more. As a disabled child growing up in Nigeria, Joshua Anum did not see internet stardom in his future. 
He and his eight siblings, abandoned by their father, barely had enough to eat. Now the 15-year-old who lost his left arm at age five after falling out of a tree is part of a dance group called the Incredible Kids. Before I joined this team, I partied a lot and I was always fighting. I didn't go to school. But since I joined this dance group, I now go to school. I read and I dance and I don't do all those negative things anymore. The troupe perform fast-paced routines to popular Nigerian songs. They have become a hit online, with a growing Instagram following and a packed performance schedule. The children live with dancer Maliki Emmanuel, the group's founder, on the outskirts of Nigeria's capital, Abuja. Most come from difficult family situations and found refuge with him. The group has performed in Abuja and Lagos, and as their fame grows, Emmanuel said he hopes their numbers will too. I'm looking at taking more kids, but I want these ones to grow first. When we've created the brand, let the brand big, then we can recruit more kids, to kids that are on the street that doesn't have what they are doing, that have the talent of dancing, or some that wish to dance, that love dance, I can teach them, then we'll bring them to the crew also. The proceeds from their performances cover school fees for Joshua and the other dancers. Joshua said dancing had changed his life. I believe, so. I believe that when I'm dancing, I don't feel anything. I'm free and feel like I have two hands and that nothing has happened to me. Mm. Louis and Nax of Reuters filed at that report. Andy Warhol's short Sage Blue Marilyn sold for a cool $195 million on Monday night, making the iconic portrait of Marilyn Monroe the most expensive artwork by a U.S. artist ever sold at auction. The 1964 silk screen image showing Monroe in a vibrant close-up is also the most expensive piece from the 20th century ever auctioned, according to the seller Christie's Auction House in New York. Christie's said an unnamed buyer made the purchase Monday night. The proceeds of the sale will go to the Thomas and Doris Amman Foundation in Zurich, which put up the painting up for auction. The foundation aims to help children with health care and educational programs. Warhol created more than one image of Monroe. This particular painting has been exhibited in museums around the world. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our new Facebook page, facebook.com slash VOA Africa. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.